This episode and every episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Ironmonger Brewing. Visit Ironmonger at their tap room in Marietta, Georgia, or online at ironmongerbrewing.com. Open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yo, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. Welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios in Marietta, Georgia. And this week, we are talking with Parliament Brewing Company. I am Tim Dennis, and with me as always is my good friend and co-host Brian Hewitt. Brian, did I say Tim Dennis or 10 Dennis? Because I got some grief last week. Nine or 10 different Dennis's. I There's had, so I, many. I wasn't There's paying so close many. enough attention. I was, okay, fair I was enough. thinking about the things I was going to say. Uh, fine, fine. Okay. Well, hello, Tim. Joining us today, we have Justin Bosch, the brewmaster for Parliament Brewing Company. We're going to talk IPA from the West Coast, from crystal clear to bitter and jet black and roasty, uh, their recent releases, and probably owls, Tim. Yes, owls. owls. There'll definitely be some owl talk. And Saisons. And, uh, yes, now Saisons. Probably not the superb kind of owls, but the Could regular be. kind you of owls. You never know. <laughs> Justin, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a fan of all those things, particularly owls, but certainly West Coast IPA Saisons. <laughs> you would probably say that your owls are pretty superb, right? I'd say they're they're some of the best owls. See? They're some yeah, of the I best. Knew it. I knew <laughs> yeah. it, man. Absolutely. Well, Justin, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you, learning more about your brewery. So before we get rolling here, how's the week going for you, man? Any interesting beers or events out there in uh, California? It's been a good week. Just brewing a lot of beer. Loving this kind of mild winter we're having. Wishing I could go skiing, but a little too busy brewing. Got to be done, right? So what's a mild winter for you in your area? I grew up on the East Coast, so I'm used to snow and sleet and everything. But out here, I mean, honestly, a cold night is if it even dips below freezing for an hour. Uh, most of the time, it's like 40 to 60 daytime temperatures there, and it just rains a little bit. Sounds about like what we've been having. We've had a couple of cold snaps, short term. Yeah. But uh, for what are we? We're, uh, oh, we're 38 degrees right now. Wow. Are we? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was Christy. extremely cold on the way into the studio. Yeah, you know what? Okay. You ought to do what they did in that that TV show and just take the uh, a small brew house up to the uh, ski lodge and brew there and figure out a way to use natural stuff from and then go skiing. You know, like pine melt cones snow and, and snow pine cones. And, okay, yeah, there you go. The yeah. spruce, that's, a, that's an untapped oh, opportunity. Was it a brew dog show or whatever back in the day where they would go no different idea. places and use whatever ingredients just okay. to travel around and be extreme? I think that's what it was. Right. But it's an and a justification for him to go out skiing when he should be brewing. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what yeah. I'm thinking. So, Brian, we had a decent week. We got to party with one of our friends down at Eventide Brewing. They yeah. celebrated their seventh anniversary. And I was reminiscing there the first time I visited those guys, their tap room wasn't even open. And they had the, the space that they took over was an old office that I think was built back 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s somewhere in there somewhere in there just one of those decades one of those decades but the <laughs> they had cubicles that were built out of like like stained hardwoods it was a real interesting thing because in most offices now you see just the fabric walls popped up in there but these were you know really nice built out cubicles and they repurposed that into part of their tap room a little cubby hole they've got off to the side but uh we went down there where our friend adam is a brewer yep. there and they had a belgian triple as their anniversary beer. And like we're talking about the Saisons, Justin, and you know, where's the love for those lately? You don't see a ton of triples either. So that was nice to see there. No, it feels like a style that when it's done well, it's awesome. And it, yeah. certainly a few places do a great job, but it doesn't, it doesn't really pop up enough. Amongst the various styles that are supposedly becoming a trend, I've heard people say that uh, the Belgian triple is potentially one it's of there. them, okay. but they might be getting it confused with the triple IPA. I'm not a hundred percent. Or triple. I might be. A Belgian yeah. triple black IPA. There you go. I think that's yes. going to be the next thing we see there. Yeah. yeah. Who even knows? Right. <laughs> yeah. So when I was there at Eventide, I think they had a rye barrel aged Weizenbach there. Weizenbach? I don't know. Weizen, Weizen. Yeah, yeah, something like that. That was really good. Very mm. boozy, nice. Mm. Some of the nice rye character to it. I just, I really enjoy this, this style. Very drinkable. They were all big beastly beers they also had an oak age highlander uh wee heavy or scotch ale which was quite nice i enjoyed all of them they were the sea wisp oh yeah the sea wisp that's something. right yeah that we was good. did it backwards we drank all their big boozy beers yes. and then we backed into a light goza they're like have you tried the goza i'm like no we haven't we've been busy drinking like 
all these huge we beers. We started off with these, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, Brian, something that we've been doing here, it's dry January. There's a lot of people out there that are going fully dry. We're going less moist. Less How moist. about that? Not fully dry, just a little less moist. Less damp. Yeah, and we've been trying sampling some uh, NA beers, and one that uh, is actually a sponsor of the show. They're doing a dry January campaign with us, Athletic Brewing, and they sent us one that we hadn't had before, Free Wave, which is their double hopped IPA. That's my favorite one they do. And it used to be the Run Wild IPA, but that's really good. And hey, heads up, if you order at athleticbrewing.com and use code BEERGUYS25, they're going to give you 25% off your first order. So if you're doing dry January, you want to check out Athletic Brewing. That's a good way to do it. And also, Brian, we just got to try a brand new, the first non-alcoholic brewery to launch in Georgia. So oh, yeah. Right Side Brewing, they sent us some of their citrus wheat, and it delivers as promised, man. It's a wheaty, nice citrusy beer. It's light. It's tasty. As our buddy Michael said, summer's day. Crack it open there. Enjoy it. So we've been pool getting side. into a little N.A. there. So Once the pool thaws, you can Once enjoy the pool it thaws. by the pool. And, you know, maybe you're a polar bear. Maybe you just jump in there with the ice and a citrus That's wheat. That's trendy now, it. too, to just jump in the, the ice-cold water for whatever health sure. benefits that apparently – gives you absolutely you know speaking of beer let's talk about the beers of the week now it's time for our beers of the week brought to you by the nest craft beer and barbecue in downtown kennesaw georgia the nest kennesaw.com well brian as always we've got a great list of beers to get into i do want to thank the nest for sponsoring this segment the nest in kennesaw georgia beer and barbecue and we want to invite everyone to come out and join their chefs versus brewers beer dinner chef and a brewer they both make a course and a beer and they pick the pairing chef picks one pairing a, a brewer the other and they compete against each other to see who picks the better pairing that is january 18th through the 21st at the nest we're going to be out there on the 21st which is when they actually pick the winner so Come on out and join us. Check it out. Are we picking the winner? Or I don't picking? think so. Okay. We just get to eat and drink, Brian. Okay. That's our that's our contribution. So All right. But I'm good with that. The beers that we're getting into this week, as I mentioned, we are doing uh, some non-alcoholic beers. So we've got a couple of uh, NAs, the Right Side Citrus Sweet, the Athletic Free Wave. We also have Saison, because we're going to get into some Saison talk. We have uh, Deschutes Cultivateur. Provision Saison, is that close enough? Sure, why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2017 on this one. Yep, and from Lupulin Brewing, we have their CPB Chocolate Peanut Butter Porter, which is not a non-alcoholic beer. Not at I all. I actually think it's pretty boozy, but uh, we'll dessert with that and have a good time with it. So, Brian, what's happening this week in the news? What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. All right. According to a new report for the first time in U.S. history, more women than men are drinking alcohol, or at least they were based on 2019 data. There is really no telling what's happened in 2020. What We'll find out soon enough. But that's a big thing. Based on the data, women made up 50.1% of alcohol drinkers in 2019. The reason given for this growth is women are increasingly delaying marriage as they pursue degrees and careers. Statistically, women drink less after marriage by a pretty large margin, apparently. So there are also shifting attitudes towards alcohol consumption for mothers, making it more acceptable for mothers to have a glass of wine or a beer without any kind of stigma of being a bad parent. So all of these factors are coming together and women are drinking. Times are changing, yes. man. Times are changing. Justin, do you see that in your tap room? Uh, how is your demographics there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we see a pretty even mix. We see people coming in as couples. We see women coming in by themselves to pick up beer. I have no idea if that's just the culture where we are, but it sounds like it's pretty normal everywhere. I mean, my wife always asks me to bring home beer. Seems like everybody here enjoys. Yeah, you know, I think we see a lot of that here too, Brian. You know, when you go yes. to a tap room, it's pretty diverse. You know, it's not just the guys and there is the stereotype of just the bearded white dude like you. There is. Yeah, just like me. But we see a pretty diverse group out there. Well, at Eventide, Haley there was is a big proponent of beer, and she's Absolutely. recently had a couple of kids. Absolutely. And it ain't slowing her down a bit. There was a time a few years ago when a new brewery opened in Georgia, and I made a comment about it's the first woman-owned brewery in Georgia. I got a lot of emails from all the ladies in Georgia that own breweries. Let me know I was mistaken, <laughs> man. And Haley being one of them. So yeah. now the the story was this was the first solely woman owned. Solely, brewery. yeah. Uh, but but you know what? I appreciate the fact that they stepped in there and like, no, you know, we've got women w women that own breweries here, and I think we've got even more female brewers in the state now. So it's uh yeah, it's it's growing. cool to see the diversity there, to see that going around. So. 
Yeah, beer doesn't require any kind of gender specifics it does at not. all. It no, is none not at all. Just specific. You just gotta like. Least. You have to like beer. Just gotta like beer. Yeah, that's that's it. it. Have a good time with it. Well, you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a break, but we'll be back very soon with more from Parliament Brewing. Looking for a great craft beer to enjoy at home? Get your beer to go at the Nest in Kennesaw, Georgia. Choose from their 48 taps to enjoy there with some tasty barbecue and take some home with you for later. Grab a crispy pilsner, a nice tart sour, or a bold stout to sit by the fire. Just bring your growler in and choose a favorite or two to take with you. It's our beer, your growler, at the Nest for your brews to go. Check out the beer and food menus before you visit at thenestkennesaw.com. Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Remember, all episodes are available on demand, so if you miss the broadcast, get the podcast. Beer Guys Radio is available on all popular and unpopular podcasting apps. Now, let's get back to Parliament Brewing Company. Justin, I'm going to start off with a question about wildlife. And uh, we'll go from there. So I think I know the answer to this. The name of your brewery and the owls, there is a relationship there, correct? There is, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's a group of owls. Parliament's a group of owls. There are a ton of names for groups of animals that have no other purpose except to describe that specific group of that specific animal. How crazy. I thought maybe you guys were really into P-Funk or something. (laughs) We get asked that a lot, although a little bit less now than when we opened. I did a little looking into owls in general just because I don't know why. I just did. Okay. And uh, they're known as a parliament, but sometimes they're also known as a congress or a stare, S-T-A-R-E. But they went to politicals and then just darted off. There, yeah, huh? they went crazy. And the reason they went parliament is apparently that was made popular in the 1950s by the Chronicles of Narnia. They okay. did that. And okay. once they did it, people are like, all right, parliament it is. Is there something that differentiates a parliament of owls from a congress of owls or a stare of owls? I think the owls would be fervently arguing together if there were a congress and stare okay. of owls, they would just be creeper just owls. Close. Just creepy. Do you know what a group of crows is called? That's a murder, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Did you see uh, the meme that goes around? It's a picture with two crows there and it says attempted murder. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Good stuff there. Uh, that is right. quality There's material. our alducation for the week. Yeah. Oh, so. God. <laughs> We've been really loving our puns. I'm not Ooh. sure the listeners are, but, uh, but we have. So. so, Justin, how did you end up uh, opening a brewery, man? Kind of tell us a little bit about your background and what led you down this path. Oh, uh, I mean, this has been... It's a dream. I, I do this with my dad and brother. We have, we've got one other employee too, but started like pretty much everybody else, brewing beer, loving it, realized it's all I ever thought about. Just dreamed of little tweaks to recipes and putting every sort of food thing in every dark beer I could imagine. And How can I do something that I can't buy on the shelf? And if I like something, how can I do it differently? It really got underway about eight years ago and I decided to go back to school to the uh, brewing program at Davis. And I actually had to take like one more like undergrad class to be able to do it. And even then, you know, I just was trying to get into the industry. I didn't know that this would be where I'd end up, but did the master brewer program at Davis. Awesome program, met many great friends, uh, obviously learned a ton, but those friendships and, and the, the education killer. I uh, ended up doing quality control at Schlafly in St. Louis. Really wonderful brewery, great beer, great people, like great program. I learned so much about what it looked like on the professional side of things. That was my first and only other brewery job besides here. And for a brewery that size, they had an incredible commitment to QC. 
I went from, you know, doing it academically and just thinking about it to seeing what these things look like in practice. And I was back here in California for a wedding five years ago. And a good friend of mine from my pro poker days said, hey, do you want to do this? I'd like to, to back you. And that's how it launched. It took us a couple of years, but we found our spot and uh, we've been operational since October 2019. Was it the result back. of a bet? I have to know. You said it was somebody from your pro poker days. So uh, like play you, for it. It's yeah. like it was, it was actually my roommate. Or me. <laughs> well, my old roommate. Your old roommate? See? Yeah, no no bets involved. But an interesting background. You got your your law degree, professional poker player, <laughs> brewer. So man, you you've had a good time with it, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, you just have to try a few things and then figure out which one you actually care about and make sure, sure you rack up about you know, six figures in debt in the meanwhile. Oh, that's sure. It's the yeah. American dream, man. You know, you mentioned UC Davis and it reminded me, I've never reached out to Charlie Bamforth to see if we could get him on the show. That would be one we... He, yeah. He's awesome. Yeah, we need to see about doing that for sure. So you mentioned brewing things you could not buy on the shelf and that immediately I'm like, well, what have you done? What have you brewed that you can't get on the shelf? Uh, so when I was living in Palo Alto, I remember just going around. I was reading about these like spruce tip beers and no one around me, no one in the Bay Area was brewing one that I could find. I was seeing them in Colorado and elsewhere. So I just went around and I <laughs> I was just looking at people's yards from afar. <laughs> <laughs> so I found this one blue spruce tree and uh, the lady was was there and I just kind of waved to her and I said, hey, like I'm a home brewer. Uh, I've been meaning to brew a beer with spruce tips. Uh, I see you've got this spruce tree. <laughs> Can I have some of your trees, please? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just collect some of these spruce tips in this Correct. bag? I'll bring you some beer in a month. Did it? I guess it worked out for you? It didn't turn out too well, but I don't blame her tree. Yes, yes. That That's, sounds accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Brian went to, yeah. Brian's from the Portland area, and he went out there and he's like, hey, man, there's a lot of spruce trees around here. I'm like, harvest some of those tips. So, yeah. Justin, I'm going to tell you, I can't guarantee those are spruce tips that we put in yeah. that beer. <laughs> it's a uh, mustard seed. Mustard, mustard tips, plant, I think, right? is what Something they were. Like that, but, I, uh, I picked them off of a tree that was growing over into a parking lot. So I didn't have to invade anybody's space to get them. It just it was growing over. I'm like, hey, these look like spruce. And so I picked them. And uh, yeah, very mustardy. So it was, yeah. Very interesting beer. <laughs> yeah, like yours, it just didn't work out no. for us, man. But we tried it, we gave it a shot there. So hey, that's what it's about. I mean, that's one of the great things about home brewing and brewing on a small scale is if something doesn't work out, it's it's not a huge loss. And that's sure you know, we're not dealing with a hundred barrels of beer here. I mean, the guys playing around there at home brewing is what gets us the amazing beer scene we've got in America right now sure. with all these exactly. things. I mean, do you think a professional brewery was the first one to put lactose and glitter in a beer? No. <laughs> yeah, we had probably. a home brewer that started that. So hundred percent sure that's the case. That's the way it had to go. I, I, I can't even tell if you're serious about the glitter. I mean, do people put glitter in beer? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, you didn't know oh, this. Yeah, oh, yeah, very much. There's definitely edible glitter. And there was a beer festival we had here a couple of years ago. There was a brewery that used, and I forget the name of the flower, but the name of it is like a scientific term for female genitalia because that's the way the flower looks on. But it makes the beer purple. So they had a sour glitter beer that was also purple. And uh, so, yeah, these things happened in the in the real world, Justin. I made a beeline for it. I made a point yeah. of uh, because <laughs> there was much talk of of the edible gl glitter beers. I've encountered two in my entire time of drinking beer that I re can recall. They were so stupid. I just had to have yeah, them. So I made a point of going ridiculousness for ridiculousness of it. Sure. There's a what is it? Sour unicorn farts. Yes. From, oh, uh, is that also glitter? I, I think, think that is glittered up. Yeah. yeah. From Duclaw. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So that makes three, and I think I still have a can of that somewhere. So there you go, Justin. <laughs> if you didn't know about that, there's something new that uh, you can put in your beer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, try it out. You get right on there, right? Being in this industry, like <laughs> I am much busier brewing beer than I ever thought I would be to the right. point that I think I drank greater variety of beer five years ago than I do today. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not really seeing the trends that are happening elsewhere because I just am so focused on what we're doing here. Head down on yours. Down. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. What are you typically drinking right now? Oh, I've, it's been pretty boring here. You know, Pilsner, IPA, Saison. Ain't nothing wrong with no that. Arguments. No arguments. No arguments. Yeah. We like all of those things. That's we, we've enjoyed a lot of the Pilsners, you know, just a, 
just a simple drinking beer. You know, something you don't have to overthink. Uh, a lot of the beers we drink, people will ask us, well, what notes did you get in it? How was this? What hops is it? I'll be honest. Sometimes I just don't think about that. I just want to drink the beer. You know, That's I, I don't point. want to Good analyze it. I just want to have a beer and enjoy it. You can't drink that many pastry stouts. I mean, you can, but, you, you know. Typically, you don't want to, especially, you know, even working hard, you know, one of them is going to put you over the edge, but you can sip on some crispy boys for a lot longer. Yeah, you can sit down and have a few of those. You know, we, we've gone out several times and, and sat down and we'll, we'll get into this a little more in the next segment. We want to have some deep dive on some Saison talk, Justin. But that's another one that I think was, uh, you know, it was cooler a few years back and you just don't see as much about it now. But that's a style that's very versatile and you can have it, you know, really light and enjoyable. We had a brewery here. They ended up not doing it, but they said when they opened up, they wanted to have like a bottle of table beer at every table. And almost like the, what's the Italian wine? That's like you, you pour you a glass and mark a crayon mark on the table or whatever. So. Oh, yeah. The, uh, oh, I can't think of it. Yeah. It's a red one. Yeah. But they ended up not yeah. doing it. But that would have been cool. I Chianti, right? That. Isn't it yeah. a Chianti or something like that? Or Who maybe knows? Not. No one knows. Nobody Brian. knows. No yeah. one knows. Where you listen to the Beer Guys radio show, we do need to take a break. But we'll be back very soon to talk Saisons with Parliament Brewing. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. You don't have to pass on great beer to stick to your dry January goals. Athletic Brewing has tasty, alcohol-free craft beer to help you stay on track. And you don't have to skip on taste. Athletic's beers have won awards versus full-strength competition. With IPAs, stouts, golden ales, and more, there's a style for every palate. And starting at only 50 calories, you can still kick back with a cold one guilt-free. Head to athleticbrewing.com to get some brews headed your way. And make sure to use code BEERGUYS25 for 25% off your first order. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I believe you have my stapler. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. I want to give a quick shout out to our newest radio affiliates, KWEN HD3 95.5 FM in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Catch Beer Guys Radio and KWEN every Saturday at 3 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. local time. Now let's get back to Parliament Brewing Company. Justin, we want to talk Saisons. You you good with that? I love Saison. Awesome, man. We do as well. So we talked a little bit off the air about Saisons and, and maybe, what, five, six, seven years ago? Yeah. They were pretty cool. You saw a lot yeah. more of them out. A lot of them. And now just not so much. We've got one brewery here that... Um, Orpheus Brewing does their tart plum saison at Atlanta that they do, but you just don't see as many of them. They slide around every now and then, but uh, Justin, that is a beer that you enjoy and you brew at Parliament, correct? You know, we've been working on one. I do enjoy it. It's a challenging style to brew because much like a Pilsner, you've got a really simple canvas and everything is going to show. You're not hiding behind hops. You're not hiding behind specific malt. So it's such a, a fermentation driven beer that whatever that yeast is saying, it's it's going to be front and center for people. So we've been really working on different variables, trying different yeasts, trying different fermentation temperatures. I haven't yet released one, but it's something, it's a project we've had in the background. It's a really good time to be a brewer because there's so many different yeast labs. There's so many different places isolating strains from everything. So I'm having a lot of fun. I can't wait till we can actually turn it into a viable beer that we're selling. But That yeast and that fermentation temperature is so important with that. I know that that was kind of key for the one we did. When you think about it, very involved, you know, more so than some of the other beers that we ever did. The We got to the point where we we could crank it out pretty good, but that was after we did it several times. But, you know, like Justin mentioned with the yeast, even when we were brewing, Brian, it was really, for the most part, why yeast in White Labs. And I think, uh, what is it, Lalamond? Is that the name of that other one? Lalvin? Mm -hmm. Something. 
that, something but, uh, like that. You know, there wasn't a lot of that. I think we saw a few that were just starting to dip onto the scene. That's right. But yeah. there's a ton of yeast labs out there right now doing a lot of fun stuff, right, Justin? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, for guys like me who are really interested in it, but I don't have like a sophisticated lab program, all these guys are doing the hard work of isolating the strains and they make it really easy for me to kind of pick and piece together the saison I want to brew. Have you ever tried capturing some yeast there wild at the brewery and, and cultivating I, that up? No, I've never I've never actually tried a wild wild capture. I know people have done that successfully and you know, being in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, sourdough is huge here. I'm not sure what people like to do with a wild capture, but I haven't done that. Yeah, yeah. you've got a pretty ideal place for uh harvesting yeah. the wild stuff from there on up to i know that uh tillamook with uh Degar, and they've got a pretty ideal they've got a lot of pasture area around there so they get some interesting funkiness going on there but that's such a great area for catching the wild yeast you ever run down to russian river with some q-tips and ziploc bags and just <laughs> start lobbing everything down there <laughs> <laughs> no no it's kind of like uh when i'm there i'm just enjoying myself but <laughs> Vinny has he's got an incredible QC program. He's got the the funky stuff and the clean stuff so segregated that yeah. I don't even know that you'd pick up anything with a Q tip. Right. That's you know, we looked. I didn't realize it. I mean, I knew they were there, just didn't register to me. But when I started looking up information on your brewery, you've got some uh you got quite a few heavy hitters really close to you, right? Russian River, Lagunitas, Bear Republic are all I think less than 10 miles from Parliament, correct? Yeah, I actually live pretty close to Lagunitas and Petaluma. We we are in the shadow of some really big guys here. So you probably had a chance to explore them pretty thoroughly. Is there any one that you've learned the most from or are most influenced by in terms of your brewing? Or there's got to be some influence there is what I'm thinking. Oh, yeah. I mean, one thing I love about it is even with these different places, they're all successful for different reasons. Like you look at the style that Lagunitas does versus Russian River or even Bear. I can think of like, you know, in my time as a beer drinker, like those aha moments when I had all those beers. The first time when I moved out here and I had Lagunitas IPA and that copper color and like the heavier body of it and like that hot profile versus like when you have a Russian River IPA and it's so dry and it has like that like the mouthfeel on it, the water profile, everything like kind of pops and it has like really that definition. And then I remember like, you know, having Hop Rod Rye for the first time and it was like all of these were kind of like nothing I'd had before. Um, right. Especially growing up on the East Coast, going to college, you know, 2001 and Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, beautiful beer that it was, was the only thing that I had as a craft beer back then. You know, I mentioned that I was down in the, the uh, just below the boot hill in Arkansas in the uh, early 90s, mid 90s there, we just didn't really have any craft beer at all. It was 98 when I moved to Atlanta. And, you know, at the time before I discovered craft, you know, I thought beers like Moosehead and Heineken were the premiums. Oh, yeah. Those were the quote unquote crafty things. There. Imports I, and things. Sure. Like that. I'd yeah. get people saying, oh, you're snooty because you bought that six pack of Moosehead when we've got all this Bud Light. <laughs> so, you know, it was really Sam Adams, as I've shared before, was yeah. my first introduction. And then, you know, came to Atlanta and they had what was, uh, I don't remember the timeline. I think it was Red Brick at the time or Atlanta Brewing. I forget when the exact change was, but we had that here. And uh, Max Lager's Brew Pub, that was, you know, really it. There was a small scene here. Uh, really just starting to discover some of those. So uh, we talked a little bit about like the Belgian triples, Justin, that was really where craft beer was at the time was Belgian imports, you know, in these areas that didn't have a lot of beer. Yeah. But I mean, when you're coming from American light lagers and that's like, you know, what you're used to anything with some flavor is just like this wow experience just to right. see like beer can be this. Yeah, seriously. The incredible flavors and I can't imagine how, well, I can kind of, because I kind of remember that time just going from stuff that's the lighter things to having these incredibly intense profiles of yeast and, and malts from uh, from the Belgians. It just, it blows your mind. You're like, there's like yeah. plums and jamminess and all this stuff that's in, in these, these flavors that you're not used to in beer. Really, You know, not everybody takes to that. Cause that's I true. Took, I took some nice beers back home one time when I went to my friends that are macro drinkers, you know, the Bud Lights or Miller Lights and you know, they drank a, uh, maybe been a rough one to start them off with, but I took some hop slam. Oh, <laughs> and I, I was, I was excited to share it because that was a very hyped beer at the time. Really, really hard to get here in Georgia at the time. So I took some of that over and, uh, I, I kid you not. One guy took a couple of sips of it and it became his dip spit bottle. 
So <laughs> yeah, he wasn't having that. So yeah, it's uh, sometimes the flavor is just too much to handle. Back in those days, that'd be tragic. So you're in the heart of like wine country there, right? Is that a, is that a plus or a minus for you? Is that working in your favor or is that kind of competition for you down there? It's kind of like the beer industry in that it's not, it's not a competitive relationship. We have a lot of friends in the wine industry. There's a winery actually like literally walking distance from us. They help us out a ton. We've bought spent barrels from them. We've put some funky beer in them. It's aging. They run ABV checks. They've got an alkalizer. You know, we don't have that sophisticated of a lab. Elsewhere, the wine industry and the beer industry here, it's it's pretty friendly. Is that, now you mentioned getting the spent barrels and that that was one question I had. Have you done a lot with you know, wine barrels or wine inspired beers? I have done some, not enough. We're a little strapped for space here. So, you know, looking at my floor, I think I've got about a total of eight barrels, some bourbon, some Syrah, some Pinot, some I think is Gewürztraminer. And uh, I would love to have, you know, a bigger space for all that. But just being able to get the barrel, like moments after it's been emptied or steamed or whatever, it's not sitting around. I can get it and fill it and I can time either my brew day or yeah. my transfer to get that barrel when it's uh, just been emptied. Sure. What's in those different barrels? I'm, I'm very curious. The, the Pinot, the Syrah, the, uh, the Gewurztraminer. What kind of beers are you putting in there? What kind of liquid are you putting in there? Yeah, so the bourbon ones are pretty predictable. We've got pastry style. We've got imperial style. We've got porter. The other ones, we've got a, uh, we've got a cherry sour, you know, like a Creek style beer. I've got a friend I've had since my home brewing days up in the Sierra Nevada mountains, one of the few Montmorency cherry growers in California. So we buy a couple hundred pounds of cherries from him, throw them in a barrel with a mixed culture and some very pale wort and let that go crazy. I've got some Brett beer and that's pretty much it right now. Well, these sound like all of my favorite things. Oh, I miss Brett too. Speaking Absolutely. of saisons and things of days of yours, I miss Everything was Back Brett for day. a while. Yep. Yeah. You're listening to the Beer Guys radio show. We do need to take a break, but we'll be back very soon with more from Parliament Brewing Company. Have you ever thought about owning your own brewery but don't know what it takes to get one built? We're Storytime Construction, and we build breweries. We're Georgia's most experienced and hands-on contractors when it comes to building new breweries and tap rooms or expanding existing breweries. We offer full build-outs, remodeling, and additions, as well as consulting and construction management. Give us a call at 770-733-4343. Storytime Construction. We build breweries. Looking for an incredible, healthy beer to kickstart your year? Try Athletic Brewing. They are revolutionizing healthy, better-for-you beer. Their beers are all non-alcoholic, but you don't have to compromise on taste. They've won awards versus full-strength competition and started only 50 calories. Drink more and be healthier in 2021. Check them out at athleticbrewing.com and use BeerGuys25 for 25% off your first order. The Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash beerguys. Patrons get cool perks like Beer Guys swag and commercial-free episodes. Now let's get back to Parliament Brewing Company. Justin, we want to talk to you some about... Uh... Something you'd mentioned to us that is kind of a, a fun thing, an inspiring thing for you is kind of the process of experimentation and recipe development. So when you go into a new beer, kind of what is your process for getting there? You know, I start with kind of a concept and I try to keep it pretty simple. It's a lot like cooking in that if you, if you start off trying to make a curry and you've got like 15 ingredients, you're not going to really know what everything is doing together. So like, for instance, when I did our porter, I started off with, you know, outside of just the base mall, and I thought of like the three things and how they should interact. And I've brewed other people's as, as a home brewer, I've brewed recipes that were more complicated, and I don't know how those were developed. And I know there are a lot of ways, but for me, 
the best way was to start kind of simple and then adding things if needed. But by beginning simply, I could keep an eye on what's what each thing was contributing. So say for the porter, you know, I knew that it needed a, a chocolatey element. So I went through a lot of different chocolate malts that were available. I picked the one that I thought had the right profile. Obviously needed a crystal malt to have that like caramel backbone. And then one of the you know signature things in a, an American porter for sure is that like dry ashy finish. And you know, tried a few different roasted barleys. I actually like the one from Brees a lot uh, for that. And then I just kept those ingredients and I just played around with the ratios. Um, so just those those three things and just two row. So a really simple recipe for me. And um, I think that's that's how it, for me I I develop most of the recipes. I start with the concept, try to think about what's going to be the the main contribution, and then think about how I can get there, and then start start growing. You know, I think that's something for for those that didn't catch it. If you're a home brewer, that's a tip a lot of home brewers are given when they're brewing a recipe is, you know, you'll brew that recipe the first time and you think, I want this maltier, I want this hoppier, I want it drier. So you'll change this, 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 and this. And then you brew it again and you don't know which, if it doesn't come <laughs> out right, you don't know because you changed too many factors there. So, you know, you kind of, it's a process there. You're like, you know what? This needs to be a little drier and a little hoppier. So uh, I'm going to up the hops on this version and see what it is. You know, you can't change 14 variables and really get anywhere with it. Correct? That's exactly it. It's, it's like whack-a-mole if you're trying to do too many things and you don't even know where you what you've changed and what's doing what. Right. Whack-a-mole was very much my brewing process. I would, I was, would, yeah. I would put together all sorts of things to take a recipe. And I'm like, all right, I want a little bit of this for this. I want list to do that component i want this to do that component put it all together and brew it all at once instead of taking the base and going from there it was very much really weird and experimental immediately and right it didn't always turn out it turned out more often than it didn't to be honest with you that's because i was there <laughs> as the yin to your yang brian i would say things like justin i'd be like you know what before we do this triple seafood goza dry hop beer, Brian, <laughs> let's try a basic Saison. He's like, well, that's, there's no excitement in that. Yeah, that's, so, that's lame. It's like, let's brew the base style there and then we'll go from there and kind of add to it and, and build on that. So that's something, you know, a lot of guys come out and they, they're enamored by these chocolate peanut butter imperial porters, Brian, these big pastry beers. And they may try doing that at home, but if you can't brew a basic stout, you know, if you, d you can take a crappy beer and throw a bunch of peanut butter and all that stuff into it, it's going to be a crappy beer with peanut butter. Part of the hard part is a lot of people get, well, they used to get into it. I don't know if they still do. They would see something that they really liked. And I'm like, I want more of that. It's hard to come by or it's too expensive. I want to do that specific beer for us. It was uh KBS. We want to do KBS right off the bat. That's sure. that's where we got started with homebrewing. That's such a, a hard place to start because right. you're immediately going 83 different grains, you know, 12 different hops and 96 pounds of yeah. various chocolate cocoa nibs or whatever, you know. Has there been a beer that you've went into and it just totally 180'd where you thought you were going with it? Well, I mentioned that brown ale. I mean, when I started, it was uh trying to get that toasty character. And I just went way overboard because I was thinking, well, you know, like you guys were saying with designing these beers, I was thinking, you know, you want more of that. But you don't always realize that to get to make something be a bigger part of a recipe, it's not always about using more of that. Sometimes it's about quieting the other parts to give it a, a bigger relative role. So I yeah. started trying to use so much brown malt and it just tasted like you'd, you'd over toast and toast and then you scraped off the black and then you just like, that's what you were drinking. And it was hard part. Huh? Okay. All right. <laughs> that doesn't sound good, Justin. I'm just going to say, you know, and, yeah, uh, I didn't, I didn't serve that to anybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now you get, uh, you mentioned, you know, like your grain bills and all that we've seen here in the South, uh, more like craft monsters popping up. You know, you mentioned Brees and that, but do you have some craft monsters there doing some unique stuff there in California? Yeah, I mean, we actually have where we are in Roner Park, California, there's grizzly malts across across the way, across town. Another one that's a little bigger and is pretty popular, Admiral Maltings uh, in Alameda. And a ton of breweries out here use them. Right now for us, you know, I support the idea of trying to get as much sourced here for a million different reasons. But to be completely honest, and they're not shy about it either, it's a little more expensive. And sure. certainly, yeah. certainly at this time, I've, we've got to keep our budget tight. Big bags of base. It would right? have to be yep. with the real estate prices because you need a certain amount of real estate to to malt the grains. I mean, 
that's just a, the nature of the business. So if they're in if they're in city limits, they're not going to be cheap, I would imagine. Yeah, no. but there is some stuff you can do with yeah. that that we've heard about. Uh, Justin, we've had some brewers here that have just you know developed their own malt with a small malt house. You know, there's a uh, the pecan wood smoked wheat, Brian, that, oh, that's yeah. been used around here by several brewers. You know, they they went to we've got in Asheville, North Carolina, we've got Riverbend Malting. And, you know, they do a little custom stuff like that that helps you have fun with it. Hey, that's pretty cool. I, I love how local the beer industry has become. And that's true with the malting. That's true with just, you know, you were talking about being in Arkansas and what's available there. I feel like I could go almost anywhere in America and find like a good brewery within 20 or 50 miles. I think you could now. Maybe not back not 25 that. years nice. ago, but you now for sure. That's the other yeah, 25 years ago. I think we were kind of the tail end of the, uh, the brew pub boom there so just coming to the end of for those that actually experienced it so. yeah yeah seriously you know before we get too far into the show or too close to the end here we should talk about your beer to start off with do you have like a flagship beer or a beer that you're best known for right now probably like everybody else i i hope that that wouldn't happen i wanted to keep it keep it moving keep it interesting here but recently as we've started getting into canning just because of the pandemic uh we were a little ahead of schedule on that one of the beers that we were doing, we started canning it, and it's become one that we just have to brew every time. It's called Kaleidoscope. It's, of course, a hazy IPA, citrus strata driven. So, you know, cheater hops, delicious. And um, keep that turning every time, but having a lot of fun with other stuff, too. Now, it's not a crime to have something that you brew frequently because people really like it. I mean, that's some would say that's actually an, a good thing for a business sure. <laughs> to have a product that people really enjoys them enjoy them for so so what have you been uh, what have you been brewing recently what's what's coming out so right now we're kind of thinking we're, we're messing around with some darker stuff uh, i have an imperial stout that i brewed on new year's eve some of that's going to go into barrel the rest of it's going to get canned in a few weeks and uh we're going to do our pastry stout we piloted that a few rounds tried a lot of different adjunct combinations and uh I'm going to be doing that next month. So, you know, we were talking about it before the recording, just about pastry stouts and how you can't drink five of them. Sometimes you just want that Pilsner. You want a couple Pilsners or Kolsch's. But it is really satisfying to take a beer, like, you know, you were saying KBS earlier, to take a style like that that has so many things, so many moving parts, and to feel like you've put something together that's really satisfying, even if you only want five ounces of it and share the rest of the bottle with somebody else. Oh, absolutely. I love those yeah. kind of beers. We t I don't remember if it was on the show or before the show, but we were talking about uh, Black Tuesday there from the brewer. Yeah. And uh, we opened a bottle on Thanksgiving, and I think it was one of the 20% versions or 20% plus versions. I believe versions. so, yeah. Uh, but that's one about four ounces. That is really all I can handle. <laughs> but I really, really enjoy that four ounces of it. You know, it's it's really nice, especially after a, a big meal and a couple of Pilsners. It's nice to sit down for that with that big dessert -y beer. It's a perfect nightcap. Absolutely, man. Just and really the great thing it. about that beer is the nature of it. It's not super carbonated. It's super boozy. You can really kind of cork that and, and drink it again later on or hit it the next day. And we did. Get and it was still really good. Thing, yeah. Pump the air out and you put it in there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that there's something to be said for those beers. I, I'm sure you wouldn't want to do that with every big pastry stout out there, but some of them you can get away some with. Some of them can yeah. handle it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. If folks want to learn more about what is happening with Parliament Brewing Company, where are they going to go to do that? Most of what we do, we post on Instagram, Parliament Beer. Uh, the spelling is, is new to a lot of people. So it's P-A-R-L-I-A-M-E-N-T Beer. Thank you both for having me. It's been really great talking to you and talking about all the great stuff about beer. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate it. And that about wraps it up for this episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Join us next week as we talk with Upcountry Brewing. We are Beer Guys Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week, and don't forget to drink local. Cheers. <laughs>